Stories of Futures Past presents 10 short short stories also known as flash fiction volume 2 The Hands by Richard Sternbach Experiment by Frederick Brown The Last Supper by T D Ham The Recluse by Mike Curry An Ounce of Cure by Alan E. Nurse Lost in the Future by John Victor Peterson Course of Empire by Richard Wilson Time for Survival by George O. Smith I Bring Fresh Flowers by Robert F. Young First Stage, Moon, by Dick Hetchell The Hands, by Richard Sternbach Originally published in Amazing Stories, October-November, 1953 Narrated by Tom Trisser He was a gigantic figure sitting there atop the mountain. He could have leaned over and dammed the river below with a finger. He sat on top of the mountain, and his beard in the wind was a white flag. Across the plains, as he watched, there were fires glowing, and the mountain under him trembled from explosions in a thousand miles away. He bent his head and a muffled cry reverberated down the hillside and through the valley. A smaller figure appeared beside him, looking sad. "'Try again, father,' the smaller one said. The old one shook his head. "'It would be the same. Give them another chance. They would do it again. Just once more.' The old one shook his head again, and for a while they sat, and they watched the destruction. The fires burned higher, and the explosions shook the mountain more roughly. At last, at the end, the old one reached down and scooped up some clay from the bank of the river. He held it in a huge gentle hand and the younger one smiled. You are good to give them another chance, father. Not them, said the old one. What do you mean? the son asked wonderingly. Something else, the majestic figure answered, starting to knead the clay. What shall it be? The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Experiment by Frederick Brown Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, February 1954 Narrated by Tom Trusser The first time machine, gentlemen! Professor Johnson proudly informed his two colleagues. True, it is a small-scale experimental model. It will operate only on objects weighing less than three pounds, five ounces, and for distances into the past and future of twelve minutes or less. But it works. The small-scale model looked like a small scale, a postage scale, except for two dials in the part under the platform. Professor Johnson held up a small metal cube. Our experimental object, he said, is a brass cube weighing one pound, 2.3 ounces. First, I shall send it five minutes into the future. He leaned forward and set one of the dials on the time machine. Look at your watches, he said. They looked at their watches. Professor Johnson placed the cube gently on the machine's platform. It vanished. Five minutes later, to the second, it reappeared. Professor Johnson picked it up. Now five minutes into the past. He set the other dial. 
Holding the cube in his hand, he looked at his watch. It is six minutes before three o'clock. I shall now activate the mechanism by placing the cube on the platform at exactly three o'clock. Therefore, the cube should, at five minutes before three, vanish from my hand and appear on the platform five minutes before I place it there. How can you place it there, then? asked one of his colleagues. It will, as my hand approaches, vanish from the platform and appear in my hand to be placed there. Three o'clock. Notice, please. The cube vanished from his hand. It appeared on the platform of the time machine. See? Five minutes before I shall place it there. It is there! His other colleague frowned at the cube. But, he said, what if now that it has already appeared five minutes before you place it there, you should change your mind about doing so and not place it there at three o'clock? Wouldn't there be a paradox of some sort involved? An interesting idea, Professor Johnson said. I had not thought of it, and it will be interesting to try. Very well, I shall not. There was no paradox at all. The cube remained. But the entire rest of the universe, professors and all, vanished. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Last Supper by T. D. Ham Originally published in IF, Worlds of Science Fiction, September 1952 Narrated by Tom Trussell Hampered as she was by the child in her arms, the woman was running less fleetly now. A wave of exultation swept over Guldron, drowning out the uneasy feeling of guilt at disobeying orders. The instructions were mandatory and concise. No capture must be attempted individually. In the event of sighting any form of human life, the ship must be notified immediately. All small craft must be back at the landing space not later than one hour before take-off. Anyone not so reporting will be presumed lost. Guldron thought uneasily of the great seas of snow and ice sweeping inexorably toward each other since the earth had reversed on its axis in the great catastrophe a millennium ago. Now summer and winter alike brought paralyzing gales and blizzards heralded by the sleety snow in which the woman's skin-clad feet had left the tracks which led to discovery. His trained anthropologist's mind speculated avidly over the little they had gotten from the younger of the two men found nearly a week before, nearly frozen and half-starved. The older man had succumbed almost at once. The other, in the most primitive sign language, had indicated that, of several humans living in caves to the west, only he and the other had survived to flee some mysterious terror. Guldron felt a throb of pity for the woman and her child, left behind by the men, no doubt, as a hindrance. But what a stroke of fortune that there should be left a male and female of the race to carry the seed of terror to another planet, and what a triumph if he, Guldron, should be the one to return at the eleventh hour with a prize. No need for calling for help. This was no armed war party, but the most defenceless being in the universe, a mother burdened with a child. Guldron put on another burst of speed. His previous shouts had served only to spur the woman to greater efforts. Surely there was some magic word that had survived even the centuries of illiteracy. Something equivalent to the bread and salt of all illiterate peoples. Cupping his hands to his mouth, he shouted, Food! Food! Ahead of him, the woman turned her head, leaped lightly in mid-stride and went on, slowing a little, but still running doggedly. Goldron's pulse leaped, he yelled again, Food! 
The instant that his foot touched the yielding surface of the trap, he knew that he had met defeat. As his body crashed down on the fire-sharpened stakes, he knew too the terror from which the last men of the human race had fled. Above him the woman looked down, her teeth gleaming wolfishly. She pointed down into the pit, spoke exultantly to the child. Food! said the last woman on earth. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Recluse by Mike Curry Originally published in Planet Stories, Winter 1954 Narrated by Tom Trussell The human voice, had there ever been so sweet a sound? Arak Miller ached for it, too eagerly, too swiftly. Twenty-five years later, a ship appeared on an afternoon in the planet's summer. Arak Miller watched it from the Mesa. From Earth, he thought, from Earth! But Arak Miller was an ordered man. Even now, in the face of resurging visions of his wife and his sons and his work and the mighty civilization from which he had been cut adrift, his thoughts were ordered. Probably the ship had arrived from Earth to re-survey one of the Class II uninhabitable planets of the Alpha Centaurus system. Tomorrow its scout ships would whip along the day sides at five thousand feet. Tomorrow atop the Mesa he must light his pyres some hundred odd gigantic piles of pine trees and brush that would burn with billowing smoke. He must signal the presence of a lone earthman. With a hypnotic intensity he stood watching the ship until, toward evening, it merged into the grey sky over the horizon. Then he ran across the clearing and down to his house by the river that wound through the valley a thousand feet below. "'Come on, you fool!' he shouted to Marbach, sitting beneath a tree. Arak Miller threw the figure over his shoulder and carried him to the house. He sat Marbach on a chair and went into the kitchen to eat. Arak Miller had been nomadic the first few years after he crashed and had been abandoned for dead, until he found in the planet's narrow temperate zone one of the few arable regions capable of sustaining him. There was sufficient small game— the river was cool, and because the rain fell mainly in the valley, his pyres were safe. In recent years he was always building. He had added a front porch to the cabin he had started with, then more rooms which he had never used, then an attic into which he never went. Now it was a house. It had chairs and tables, a bed, a rug of vines, a garden for vegetables and tobacco, and a garden for flowers. He ate a leisurely meal of potatoes and corn, and meat of the rabbit-like creatures which he trapped. Miss Gormley was sitting on the porch as he went out. "'A ship's come!' he shouted. "'I may be saved, you understand?' He recalled he had intended to do something about Miss Gormley's nostril. With one of his knives he scraped a little against the wall of her left nostril. Then he stood back, satisfied. "'Now you look better,' he said. With a wry grin, he added, "'You can smell better, too.' For a long time he could not sleep, remembering that he had been cut off in the prime of his life. He had been the senior astrophysicist in the system's war office on Earth, working on the second Einstein modifications that promised travel to the more distant galactic systems. He had completed six months of comparison spectrography in the barren Centaurus system and had been about to take the year's return journey to Earth, looking forward to a vacation trip with his family to Venus City. He had been in the forefront of the free world's pushing back of the last frontiers of man. He twisted on his bed in a wild agony of hope and yearning. Some day soon, he shouted to the walls, I'll ride the monorail across the western plains. He had discovered that it helped to talk aloud, though none of his devices would make him forget he was a prisoner. To feel the centaurus skies closing down on him and the alien mountains crushing him so far from his work and those he loved 
was to feel a terrible suffocation from which there was no release. But then he would go doggedly to work, or else carve the life-size figures to keep him silent company and try to forget. He talked on and on, and finally he could talk no more. He slept. He was awakened by a pattering on the roof. Rain! he shouted. He jumped up and ran to the window socket. The rain clouds were high and heavy with storm. It struck him like a blow. They hung above the Misa, above his pyres. In a panic he clambered up to the Misa, forgetting his breakfast, forgetting his outer clothing, his mind in disorder. The shock wave pounded his eardrums. He was too startled to make words. With unbelieving eyes he saw, about five miles away where the river emptied into the sea, the black cloud of an atomic explosion rise into the sky to spread out under the rain. Then suddenly he was running blindly through the rain. The scout must have come down. They must be testing. The area was ideal for testing atomic weapons. I must reach them before they leave. Through heavy undergrowth he pushed his way down the slope to the valley. His foot slipped on an exposed root. With a sharp crack of bone he fell. My ankle! he screamed, with terror smashing at his mind. He managed to find two thick lengths of branch that would serve as crutches, and he started hobbling awkwardly toward the river. For an hour he forced himself on urgently along the river bank, now feeling lifelike pain slicing up through his body. The effort of moving was beginning to exhaust him. He fell down and rested a moment. He heard a tree crash in the forest ahead. He heard someone shout. A human voice! He began to sob, softly at first, then uncontrollably. A human voice! It had never been so sweet a sound. He climbed painfully to his feet, crashed on through the undergrowth. The density of trees ended abruptly and he stopped. Around the scout ship in the clearing beyond, robot dredges were digging the foundations for buildings. Grey uniformed men were setting up a new type atomic artillery at the perimeters. Eric Miller drew a deep breath. I'm saved, he said, his voice breaking. I'm going to be a free man. He tottered on the edge of hysteria, but controlled himself with a mighty effort of will. He took a step forward to reach the clearing. Then he stopped. Something was wrong. He tried to put together the pieces of his mind. Everything looked normal. Construction going on, stores being transferred to temporary warehouses. All the usual activities of a scout party on an atomic testing mission. The artillery was pointing. That was the floor. The artillery faced inward. He looked back at the construction work. Not foundations for buildings, he said dully. Ditches. As he watched, a flag was run up on a pole. The dreams of Arak Miller crashed in his mind. It was the flag of the slave world, superimposed upon the symbol of the systems. The world controlled by the dictators, which for centuries had existed alongside the free world in a perpetual cold war. During some stage of Arak Miller's long imprisonment, from Venus to Cantorus, the dictators had taken over. Hidden from guards, he lay on the ground and watched for a long time. Only when the next batch of captives was taken out of the scout ship and lined up in front of the ditch did he turn his gaze away. He waited till the next shock wave had passed, then with tears streaming down his face, hobbled back in the rain toward the river. He crawled the last two miles to his house. Miss Gormley was sitting where he had left her. I am sorry, he said painfully. I will have to destroy you, and Marbuck, and a house, and the pyres, and when all that is done, I will have to leave this area, otherwise they might find me. Miss Gormley stared blindly out at the river. He lay still on the floor, gasping for breath. You see, he explained, I am not a prisoner. They are the prisoners, all of them. All the world, 
but me. His eyes closed in exhaustion. I like it here now, he said, almost in a whisper. I intend to stay. There must be some place here where they can never find me, you understand? The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. An Ounce of Cure by Alan Edward Nurse Originally published in the 1963 collection The Counterfeit Man More Science Fiction Stories by Alan E. Nurse Narrated by Tom Trisser The doctor's office was shiny and modern. Behind the desk, the doctor smiled down at James Wheatley through thick glasses. Now then, what seems to be the trouble? Wheatley had been palpitating for five days straight at the prospect of coming here. I know it's silly, he said, but I've been having a pain in my toe. Indeed, said the doctor. Well now, how long have you had this pain, my man? About six months now, I'd say. Just now and then, you know. It's never really been bad. Until last week, you see. I see, said the doctor. Getting worse all the time, you say? Wheatley wiggled the painful toe reflectively. Well, you might say that. You see, when I first... How old did you say you were, Mr. Wheatley? Fifty-five? Fifty-five! The doctor leafed through the medical record on his desk. But this is incredible. You haven't had a check-up in almost ten years. I guess I haven't, said Wheatley apologetically. I've been feeling pretty well until... Feeling well? The doctor stared in horror. But, my dear fellow, no check-up since January 1963. We aren't in the Middle Ages, you know. This is 1972. Uh, well, of course. Of course, you may well be feeling well enough, but that doesn't mean everything is just the way it should be. And now, you see, you're having pains in your toes. One toe, said Wheatley, the little one on the right. It seemed to me... One toe today, perhaps, said the doctor heavily, but tomorrow. He heaved a sigh. How about your breathing lately? Been growing short of breath when you hurry upstairs? Well, I have been bothered a little. I thought so. Heart pound when you run for the subway. Feel tired all day. Pains in your calves when you walk fast. Uh, yes, occasionally. I... Wheatley looked worried and rubbed his toe on the chair leg. You know that fifty-five is a dangerous age, said the doctor gravely. Do you have a cough? Heartburn after dinner? Prop up on pillows at night? Just as I thought. And no check-up for ten years, he sighed again. I suppose I should have seen to it, Wheatley admitted. But you see, it's just that my toe— My dear fellow, your toe is part of you. It doesn't just exist down there all by itself. If your toe hurts, there must be a reason. Wheatley looked more worried than ever. There must? I thought, perhaps you could just give me a little something. To stop the pain? The doctor looked shocked. Well, of course, I could do that. But that's not getting at the root of the trouble, is it? That's just treating symptoms. Medieval quackery. Medicine has advanced a long way since your last check-up, my friend, and even treatment has its dangers. Did you know that more people died last year of aspirin poisoning than of cyanide poisoning? Wheatley wiped his forehead. I, dear me, I never realised. You have to think about those things, said the doctor. Now, the problem here is to find out why you have the pain in your toe. It could be inflammatory, maybe a tumour, perhaps it could be uh, functional, or maybe vascular. Uh, perhaps you could take my blood pressure or something, Wheatley offered. Well, of course I could, but that isn't really my field, you know. It wouldn't really mean anything if I did it, and there's nothing to worry about. We have fine hypertensive man at the diagnostic clinic. The doctor checked the appointment book on his deck. Now, if we could see you there next Monday morning at nine. Very interesting x-rays, said the young doctor with the red hair. Very interesting. See this shadow in the duodenal cap? 
See the prolonged emptying time? And I've never seen such a beautiful polorospasm. This is my toe? asked Wheatley, edging toward the doctors. It seemed he had been waiting for a very long time. Toe? Oh, no, said the red-headed doctor. No, that's the orthopaedic radiologist's job. I am a gastrointestinal man myself. Upper, Dr. Schultz's area is lower. The red-headed doctor turned back to his consultation with Dr. Schultz. Mr. Wheatley rubbed his toe and waited. Presently another doctor came by. He looked very grave as he sat down beside Wheatley. "'Tell me, Mr. Wheatley, have you had an orthodiagram recently?' "'No. An EKG?' "'No. Fluororthogram?' "'I don't think so.' The doctor looked even graver and walked away, muttering to himself. In a few moments he came back with two more doctors. "'No question in my mind that is cardiomegaly,' he was saying, "'but the Haddonfield should know. "'He's best left ventricle man in the city. "'Excellent paper in the AMA journal last July. "'The inadequacies of modern orthodogmatic techniques "'in demonstrating minimal left ventricular hypertrophy. "'A brilliant study, simply brilliant. "'Now this patient,' he glanced toward Wheatley, "'and his voice dropped to a mumble. "'Presently two other men nodded, "'and one walked over to Wheatley, cautiously, "'as though afraid he might suddenly vanish. "'Now there's nothing to be worried about, Mr. Wheatley,' he said. "'We're going to have you fixed up in just no time at all. "'Just a few more studies. "'Now if you could see me in the valve clinic tomorrow afternoon at three. "'Wheatley nodded. "'Nothing serious, I hope.' "'Serious? Oh, no, dear me, you mustn't worry. "'Everything is going to be all right,' the doctor said. "'Well, I—' "'That is—' "'My toe is still bothering me some. "'It's not nearly as bad, but I wondered if maybe you—' "'Dawn broke on the doctor's face. "'Give you something for it? "'Well, now, we aren't therapeutic men, you understand. "'Always best to let the expert handle the problem in his own field.' "'He paused, stroking his chin for a moment. "'Tell you what we'll do. "'Dr. Epstein is one of the finest therapeutic men in the city.' "'He could take care of you in a jiffy. "'We'll see if we can't arrange an appointment with him "'after you see me tomorrow.' "'Mr. Wheatley was late to Mitchell Valve Clinic the next day "'because he had gone to Aortic Valve Clinic by mistake, "'but finally he found the right waiting room. "'A few hours later he was being thumped, photographed and listened to. "'Substances were popped into his right arm and withdrawn from his left arm as he marvelled at the brilliance of modern medical techniques. Before they were finished, he had seen by both the mitral men and the arctic men, as well as the gate arteries man and the peripheral capillary bed man. The therapeutic man happened to be in Atlantic City at a convention, and the rheumatologist was on vacation, so Wheatley was sent to functional clinic instead. "'Always have to rule out these things,' the doctors agreed, wouldn't do much good to give you medicine if your trouble isn't organic now, would it? The psychoneuroticist studies his sex life, while the psychosociologist examined his social milieu. Then they conferred for a long time. Three days later he was waiting in the hallway downstairs again. Heads met in a huddle. Words and phrases slipped out from time to time as the discussion grew heated. No doubt in my mind that it's a... "'But we can't ignore the endocrine implications, doctor.' "'You're perfectly right there, of course. "'Bittenbender at the university might be able to answer the question. "'No better pituitary osmoreceptorologist in the city. "'A tubular function man should look at those kidneys first. "'He's fifty-five, you know. "'Has anyone studied his filtration fraction? "'Might be a peripheral vascular spasticity factor.' "'After a while, James Wheatley rose from the bench.' and slipped out the door, limping slightly as he went. The room was small and dusky, with heavy Turkish drapes obscuring the dark hallway beyond. A suggestion of incense hung in the air. In due course, a gaunt, swarthy man in moustache and turban appeared through the curtains and bowed solemnly. "'You come with a problem?' he asked in a slight accent. "'As a matter of fact, yes,' James Wheatley said hesitantly. "'You see, I've been having a pain in my right little toe.'" The End
Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Lost in the Future by John Victor Peterson Originally published in Fantastic Universe, January 1954 Narrated by Tom Trussell Albrecht and I went down in a shuttle ship, leaving the Stellatomic orbited pole to pole 2,000 miles above Alpha Centauri's second planet. While we took an atmosphere brushing approach which wouldn't burn off most of the shuttle's skin, we went as swiftly as we could. A week before, we had completed man's first trip through hyperspace. We were now making the first landing on an inhabited planet of another sun. All the preliminary investigations had been made via electron spectroscopes and electron telescopes from the Stellatomic. We knew that the atmosphere was breathable, and were reasonably certain that the peoples of the world into whose atmosphere we were dropping were at peace. We went unarmed, just the two of us. It might not be wise to go in force. We were silent, and I know that Henry Albrecht was as perplexed as I was over the fact that our all-wave receivers failed to pick up any signs of radio communication whatever. We had assumed that we would pick up signals of some type as soon as we had passed down through the unfamiliar planet's ionosphere. The scattered arrangement of the towering cities appeared to call for radio communications. The hundreds of atmosphere ships flashing along a system of airways between the cities seemed to indicate the existence of electronic navigational and landing aids. But perhaps the signals were all tightly beamed. We would know when we came lower. We dropped down into the airway levels, and still our receivers failed to pick up a signal of any sort, not even a whisper of static. And strangely, our radar scopes failed to record even a blip from their atmosphere ships. I guess it's our equipment, Harry, I said. It just doesn't seem to function in this atmosphere. We'll have to put Edwards to work on it when we go back upstairs. We spotted an airport on the outskirts of a large city. The runways were laid out with the precision of Earth's finest. I put our ship's nose eastward on a runway and took it down fast through a lull in the atmosphere ship traffic. As we went down, I saw tiny buildings spotted on the field which surely house electronic equipment, but our receivers remained silent. I taxied the shuttle up to an unloading ramp before the airport's terminal building, and I killed the drive. Harry, I said, if it weren't that the ship was so outlandishly stubby and the building so outflung, we might well be on Earth. I agree, Captain. Strange, though, that they're not mobbing us. They couldn't take this Delta Wind Dump for one of their ships. It was strange. I looked up at the observation ramp's occupants. People who, except for their bizarre dress, might well be of Earth, and saw no curiosity in the eyes that sometimes swept across our position. Be that as it may, Harry, we certainly would cause a stir in these pressure suits. Let's go. We walked up to a dour-looking individual at a counter at the ramp's end. Clearing my throat, I said rather inanely, Hello, but what does one say to an extrasolarian? I realised then that my voice seemed thunderous, that the only other sounds came from a distance, the city's noise, the atmosphere ship's engines on the horizon. The centaurian ignored us. I looked at the atmosphere ships in the clear blue sky, at the centaurians on the ramp who appeared to be conversing, and there was no sound from those planes, no sound from the people. "'It's impossible,' Harry said. "'The atmosphere is nearly Earth normal. It should be. Well, damn it, it is as sound conductive. We're talking, aren't we?' I looked up at the Centaurians again. They were looking exactly westward. Some turned to companions. Mouths opened and closed to form words we could not hear. 
wide eyes lowered, following something I could not see. Sick inside, I turned to Albrecht and read confirmation in his drawn, blanched face. Captain, he said, I suspected that we might fight something like this when we first came out of hyperspace and the big sleep. The recorders showed we'd exceeded light speed in normal space-time just after the transition. Einstein theorized that time would not pass as swiftly to those approaching light speed. We could safely exceed that speed in hyperspace, but should never have done so in normal space-time. Beyond light speed, time must conversely accelerate. These people haven't seen us yet. They certainly just observed our landing. As we suspected, they probably do have speech and radio, but we can't pick up either. We're seconds ahead of them in time, and we can't pick up from the past sounds of nearby origin or nearby signals radiated at night speed. They'll see and hear us soon, but we'll never receive an answer from them. Our questions will come to them in their future, but we can never pick answers from their past. Let's go, Harry, I said quickly. Where? he asked. Where can we ever go that will be an improvement over this? He was resigned. Back into space, I said. Back to circle this system at a near light speed. The computers should be able to determine how long and how slow we'll have to fly to cancel this out. If not, we're truly and forever lost. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Course of Empire by Richard Wilson Originally published in Infinity Science Fiction, February 1956 Narrated by Tom Thrissel Mars' sands are red, Earth's face is too. We were too green, and now we're blue. The older man sat down on the grassy bank on the hill overlooking the orchard. The autumn sun was bright, but the humidity was low and there was a breeze. The younger man sprawled next to him. Cigarette, he asked. Thanks, said Roger Boynton. He looked across the valley, past the apple trees, to the fine white columned house on the hill beyond. He smiled reminiscently. A friend of mine once owned that house, a fellow commissioner in world government. He and I used to sit on this very hill sometimes. We'd munch on an apple or two that we'd picked on our way through the orchard. Wine saps, they're called. "'You were telling me about the colonizing,' said Alistair gently, after a pause. The older man sighed. Yes. He put out the cigarette carefully, stripped it, scattered the tobacco, and wadded the paper into a tiny ball. "'I was commissioner of colonies. I had to decide, after my staff had gathered all the data, who would be the best man to put in charge. It was no easy decision.' I can imagine. You can't really. There were so many factors and the data were actually quite skimpy. The way it worked out, to be candid with you, was on the basis of the best guess. And some of the guesses were pretty wild. We knew Mars was sandy, for instance, and so we put a Bedouin in charge. That pleased the Middle East in general and Jordan in particular. Jordan donated a thousand camels under point four point four. I beg your pardon, said Alistair. That's not double talk. Point four was the old terrestrial program for underdeveloped countries. World government adopted it and broadened it. Mars is the fourth planet, so... He traced 4.4 in the air, stabbing a finger at the imaginary point. Point four, point four. It was undoubtedly somebody's little whimsy in the beginning, but then it became accepted for the descriptive term that it was. I see. The young man looked vague. He stubbed out his cigarette carelessly so that it continued to smoulder in the grass. Venus was the rainy planet, Boynton said, looking with disapproval at the smoking butt, though he did nothing about it. So he put an Englishman in charge. 
England sent a crate of alligators. The young man looked startled. Alligator raincoats, Boynton said. Things weren't very well organised. Too many things were happening too fast. There was a lot of confusion, and although the countries wanted to do what was best, no one knew exactly what that was. So they improvised as best they could on the basis of their little knowledge. Was it a dangerous thing? The little knowledge? Nah, not dangerous, just inefficient. Then there was Jupiter. We didn't bother about Mercury, although for a time there was some uninformed talk about sending an equatorial African to do what he could. Who went to Jupiter? Alistair asked. The United States clamoured for Jupiter and got it. The argument was that the other planets could be a cinch to colonise because of their similarity to Earth, but that Jupiter needed a real expert because it had only its surface of liquid gas and the red spot. What's that? I'm sorry, I'd forgotten you were just a youngster when all this was going on. The red spot is the Jovian's space platform. They built it a long time ago, and then they retrogressed, the way people do, and forgot how they'd done it. Earth sent an engineer to see if it could be done again. The spot was pretty overpopulated, and no real job of colonization could be done until we built one more. And did you? Well, we started to. Before we could really go to work anywhere, though, we had to solve the language problem. An Australian went to work on that. He'd had a background of Melanesian pidgin, and if anyone was suited to the job of crossbreeding four languages into one, he was. Four languages? Yes, English was the official language of Earth. Then there was Martian, Venusian, Chat-Chat, and Spotian. It was a queer amalgam, but it could be understood by everyone, more or less. So that's where it came from. Chikurimapim, Chat-Chat, too much, eh? Interplanetary Beche de Mer. Exactly. Only, of course, it was called Beche des Bas. Mitu fella vim kitchen pugum by and by. But even after the language difficulty was solved, we had our troubles. They already had camels on Mars, for instance, and the Martians were amazed when we brought in more, particularly because theirs were wild and semi intelligent and the first things the Martian camel did was come over and liberate their brothers from Earth. They never did come back. Same sort of thing with the raincoats on Venus. It doesn't rain down there, as we know now. It sort of mists up from the ground, soaks up under a raincoat in no time. Those were just pretty annoyances, of course. But they were symptomatic of the way a half-baked planning operated. You didn't know about the people of Ganymede, then? No, we were so busy trying to build another red spot that we never did get to Jupiter's satellites. Oh, it was partly a matter of appropriations, too. The Budget Commission kept explaining to us that there were only so much money and that we'd better show a profit on what we had before we put in a request to go tooling off to colonise some new place. I guess the Medans first came when you were about ten. Eleven, the younger man said. They scouted our colonies and came directly to Earth. They took right over and colonized us. A Midian overseer climbed the hill effortlessly. He was tall and tentacled, and the breathing apparatus over his head gave him the appearance of a mechanical man. Kai Kai Pinus, the Midian said. You two fella all same cha cha too much. Bahava belong work, he stop long orchard, pick him apple. The two men stood up and obediently walked down the hill towards the apple orchard. "'Why does he have to talk to us in that pigeon?' the young man asked. "'They all speak English as well as you and me. It's insulting.' "'That's why they do it, I think,' said Boynton, the former commissioner of colonies. "'They're so much better at colonising than we were that I guess they feel they have a right to rub it in.' The Medan had overheard them. "'Damn right,' he said." The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Time for Survival by George O. Smith Originally published in Fantastic Universe, March 1960 Narrated by Tom Trissel 
The storm ruined my plan. Not by seasickness. I'd come prepared for the worst, knowing how rough it could get on a sailing ship of the nineteenth century. I outrode the storm easily, stowed away in the hold. Not even the breakage of some of the seventeen hundred barrels of alcohol carried as a cargo bothered me, although the stench was terrific. But on the morning, on the twenty-fifth of November, eighteen seventy-two, the first mate, Albert Richardson, sent the second mate, Andrew Gilling, below with two other German seamen to assay the storm damage. They found me, and I was hauled aloft before Captain Briggs as a stowaway. Captain Briggs of the Mary Celeste eyed my strange clothing with deep curiosity, but his interest was obviously more concerned with my unauthorized presence. He said sternly, "When did you get aboard?" I realized that I had to impress him. I smiled. You delayed your sailing from the fifth of November to the sixth, so that you and Mrs. Briggs could have dinner to board the Gracia with Captain Morehouse. I said. How can you know so much? He exclaimed. How can you live as a stowaway for almost twenty days? I held up my Chronothon contractor, knowing that now I could impress him indeed. Captain Briggs, I said, I am a time-travelling historian from the twenty-second century. I pointed to the big red button on the top. Until I depress this button and return to my own day and age, every morning I receive my daily ration of food and water. It's about. I timed it close. I was interrupted by the click of the chronothon as its time transferred my daily ration. I opened the cabinet and offered a bite of twenty-second century breakfast to the captain. He said, "This is a sailor's tall tale, I think. You claim that you're a time-traveling historian. Then tell me." Why are you here on Mary Celeste, Captain Briggs? I said, "The time machine was invented in 1987. Within 27 years, every historical event had been painstakingly researched and authentically written, rewritten by time-traveling historians who viewed the event as partaking eyewitnesses. By my time, fame and fortune awaits any man who has the luck and dogged determination to scour historic time to locate some event that has not been recounted faithfully to the last niggling little detail. Why, Captain Briggs, in Jim Bishop's famous "The Day Columbus Landed," they record the name of the man who owned the hen that laid the egg that Columbus stood on end to impress Isabella with his ability, and so, Captain Briggs, I stowed away because I. A woman's voice interrupted me. I turned to look at the captain's wife, who, of course, was the only woman aboard Mary Celeste. She was carrying little Sophia Matilda in her arms. She said, "Edward, what unearthly manner of ship is that?" The steward, Edward Head, replied, "I don't rightly know, ma'am." I turned to look. No more than fifty feet from the starboard rail was a vast barge. Upon the barge were serried rows of seats that stretched upwards and backwards for hundreds of feet. The seats were filling rapidly. Ushers were escorting the spectators efficiently. Vendors were selling refreshments and programs. A thrumming sound came from overhead, and I looked up to watch the materialization of jet copters and personnel carriers, and even a poised spacecraft hanging in a dome above our heads. Over the lee rail came a crew of technicians carrying the heavy ward workmen tridee recorders of the twenty-seventh century, and the director pulled a script from his pocket and said. Joe, you and Pete dislocate the binnacle and break the compass. Al, open the fore hatch and Nazareth. Tony, that spring-wound chronometer is a pre-atomic clock and worth a fortune at the National Museum. Put it among my personal loot, along with the sextant. You can keep the ship's register, but give the navigation books to George with my compliments. Let's see 'em. Sails, jibs, fore topmast. Now toss the yawl overboard. Get it out of the way. It's missing. One of his men came up and said something to him that I could not hear. No, he replied. It would not be more dramatic to dummy up a half-eaten breakfast and a pan of milk warming on the stove for the baby. Too many writers try to make it that way in the beginning. I know what's authentic. Then he paused as a ward workman cameraman panned around Mary Celeste, making close-up and approach shots. One by one, they finished their work and reported to him. Fine, he said, looking at his strap watch. Now let's back off for some long shots and remember. We don't know what kind of catastrophe is going to be, so keep those tridee recorders running constantly until I tell you to stop. Captain Benjamin Spooner Briggs of Mary Celeste put an arm around his wife. To me, he said, 
I don't completely understand, but I do get enough to realise that we are the subject of something evil. Yes, I replied, you. We're not waiting here to let it happen to us, he snapped. But you can't change history, I objected. Watch, he said roughly, and then with a stentorian voice, Captain Briggs roared, Abandon ship! The captain and his wife, still carrying their daughter Sophia Matilda, mingled with the photo-recording crew. The two mates, the steward, and the four German seamen went over the side and swam swiftly for the barges. There were flurries of activity when they went aboard the barges, but then the activity stilled, and I was alone on Mary Celeste. I looked around me and realised that Captain Briggs hadn't changed history. He'd made it. Slowly the barges emptied. The spectators returned to their own time and place among the centuries. Sorrowfully I pressed my button and went home. My fame would never be. My fortune would never start. My book would remain unwritten, for I knew full well that potential customer for this historic event had been here as an eyewitness. After seeing it, who'd bother to buy my book? On the 4th of December, 1872, Captain Morehouse of Di Gracia sighted Mary Celeste yawing in a mild sea with jib and four topmast sails set, no one at the helm and no one aboard. The binnacle was knocked out of place, the compass was broken, the sextant, the chronometer, ship's register and navigation books were missing. The ship's yawl lashed to the main hatch was missing. The fore hatch and lazarette were open, and about a dozen of the ship's cargo of 1,701 barrels of alcohol were broken or leaking badly. The last notation in the ship's deck log had been made early in the morning of 25th of November 1872, and the account of the previous hours indicated that Mary Celeste had come through a severe storm on the previous day and most of the night. Accounts that include half-eaten plates of food, half-packed bags and other evidences of an abrupt interruption and panicky flight for safety are false. No survivors have ever turned up. No explanation can be given. Researchers in the mystery of Mary Celeste suggest that the storm, the leaking alcohol, combined to frighten Captain Briggs with a threat of fire or explosion, and that they all took off in the ship's yawl, which floundered. We will not to know the truth until someone invents the time machine. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. I Bring Fresh Flowers by Robert F. Young Originally published in Amazing Stories, February 1964 Narrated by Tom Trissel You know Rosemary Brooks. You have known her for many years. It is said that when she was a little girl, her favourite poem was Barbara Fritchie, and it is told how she would sometimes poke her pretty head out of her bedroom window, survey the suburban street with her blue sky eyes, and cry, Shoot, if you must! this old grey head, but spare your country's flag. Yes, you know Rosemary. You know her very well. Like all little girls, Rosemary grew up. But Rosemary did not change. This is not to say that she did not turn into an attractive young lady. She turned into a most attractive one indeed. Fragilely beautiful, airy of tread, she should have been the reigning rose of every dance she went to, but she was not. Rarely did the young men of her acquaintance ask her to dance, and never did one of them approach her and say, Come into the garden, Rosemary, for the black bat night has flown. She did not go to very many dances in any event, and looking back, one realises that the few she did attend she attended primarily to please her mother. The reason behind Rosemary's wallflowerhood is simple. The young men of her acquaintance knew 
that with her, God and the United States of America came first, and that accompanying her through life, or even accompanying her home from a dance for that matter, meant being relegated to a back seat. It is all right for little girls to be Barbara Fritchies, you see, but not for big ones. During her short and dedicated life, Rosemary poked her pretty head out of quite a number of windows. After the Barbara Fritchie window came the Girl Scouts of America window, and after the Girl Scouts of America window came the Young People's Civil War Society window, and after the Young People's Civil War Society window came the Citizens for Patriotic Progress window. Last of all came the Astronet Training Centre window. Set up by Project Raindance in 1969, after prejudice against women going into space had abated, the Astronet Training Centre had for its purpose the finding, training and conditioning of six female pilots for a series of six manned weather control satellite shots, the first of which was scheduled to take place sometime in February of 71. After exhaustive screening, 100 volunteers were accepted. Fifteen of them passed the exacting physical and psychological tests, and from the ranks of the fifteen, the six astronauts were chosen. Incredibly, when one considers her delicateness, and fails to consider her patriotic fervour, Rosemary not only made the grade, but was selected to accompany the first weather control satellite to be placed in orbit. All of this is history now. Faded words on newsprint, old photographs, a dozen dusty articles in as many magazines. But at the time, it captured the attention of the whole wide world. It is said that Madison Avenue nearly went out of its mind trying to circumvent the regulation that prohibited astronauts from underwriting testimonials to toothpaste, cosmetics and cigarettes. This is not to be wondered at. If Rose Mary could have been legally enticed, for example, into letting her picture appear in a cigarette ad, cigarette consumption probably would have doubled overnight. It is one thing to be an obscure Barbara Fritchie, and quite another to be a famous one, and the patriotic devotion shining in a person's eyes can, through the thaumaturgy of photography and touch-up, be transmuted into a sensual gleam. February of 71 arrived at last, as all months must, and a specific date was set for the launching. Psychological winter had come and gone, but no singing of birds could be heard. Even as far south as Canaveral, grey skies were the rule, and grey rain fell intermittently. Countdown was begun regardless, and then, miraculously it seemed, the skies cleared, and the day of the launching dawned bright and clear. There is a photograph of Rose Mary standing in her snow-white spacesuit at the base of the gantry, her space helmet resting in the crook of her arm. The photograph is in colour, and the blueness of her eyes is not one whit different in shade and texture from the blueness of the sky behind her. This is as it should be. Looking at her hair, one thinks of sunrises and sunsets. This is as it should be, too. When remembering Rosemary, it is fitting that one should think of the sun and the sky. It is equally fitting that one should think of the snow and the rain, for Rosemary is nothing if she is not all of these things. The launching was a good one. The Rainbow Six rode its Saturn booster like a bird on jet fire wings, and the bright star of its passage seemed to linger in the morning sky long after the booster had fallen away. The television cameras caught the action beautifully, and the American public reminded once again that the noblest thing a person can do is to risk his life for his country, looked on in awe and admiration. The orbit was a good one too. Apogee, 203 miles. Perigee, 191 miles. Rosemary radioed back that she was A-OK. -okay. She was supposed to complete three orbits, 
then climb into the escape capsule, jettison it and herself, re-enter the atmosphere, and parachute into the Atlantic. There, a task force waited eagerly to pick her up. Her mission was to orientate the satellite's weather factor instruments to the existent cloud patterns and jet streams. Once this was accomplished, the telemetric readings would, through the medium of the main weather control station in Oregon, dictate future weather. Weather control had been in effect since the middle 60s, but the telemetric readings of the unmanned weather control satellites, owing to faulty orientation, had fallen far short of the 100% accuracy needed to make the regulation of rain and sunshine something more than a half-realized dream. And it was hoped that the present satellite, given a human boost, would bring the dream to fruition. One can picture Rosemary high in the sky, faithfully carrying out her assignment. One can see her sitting there before the instrument panel of that Rainbow Six, looking at dawns and sunsets and stars. One can see the slow drift of cloud and continent beneath her, Australia now, and now the vast blueness of the Pacific, and now the west coast rising out of mists of distance and air, and beyond it, the vast green blur of the land that gave her birth. Little Barbara Fritchie riding on a star. Far beneath her now, highways wind, rivers run down to seas. Patternings of field and forest blend into pale blue-greens. Freshwater lakes look up at her with blue and wondering eyes. Now the sea of night drifts forth to meet her. Bravely she sets sail upon the dark waves in her little silvery ship. Brief night, soft sunrise, new day. I bring fresh showers for the thirsting flowers from the seas and the streams. I bear light shade for the leaves when laid in their noonday dreams. Little Barbara Fritchie riding on a star. Jettisoning took place exactly on schedule. The weather control satellite continued on its orbital way and Rosemary plummeted earthwards in the escape capsule. That much, at least, is known. But what took place during re-entry, whether the retro rockets failed to fire, whether the attitude controls malfunctioned, or whether the heat shield proved to be defective, is not known and never will be known. All that is known is that Rosemary became a falling star. The nation mourned, the whole wide world mourned. Project Raindance was discontinued. It would have been discontinued in any event, for Rosemary had obviated any further need for it. She had done her job well, Rosemary had, and in the doing of it she had placed the weather in the palm of mankind's outstretched hand. That spring the rains were soft and warm, and the flowers grew riotously upon the face of the earth. Grass knew a greenness it had never known before, and trees dressed each day in lovelier and lovelier dresses. The rains fell in the cities and on the plains, in valleys and in little towns, on fields and forests and lawns, and when the land had drunk its fill, the sun came out as warm and as bright as Rosemary's hair, and the sky turned as blue as her eyes. Yes, you know Rosemary, and you are in love with her in a way. If you are not, you should be. She is the sun coming up in the morning, and the sun going down at night. She is the gentle rain against your face in spring. She is the snow falling on Christmas Eve. She is every glorious rainbow you see in the rain-washed sky. She is that pattern of tree-shade over there. Each morning, when you are lying fast asleep in your trundle bed, she tiptoes into your room, her golden sandals soundless on the red room floor, and wakes you with a golden kiss. Sunlight is her laughter, her voice the patter of the rain. Soft you now. 
she speaks. I am the daughter of the earth and water, and the nursling of the sky. I pass through the pores of the ocean and shores. I change, but I cannot die. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. First Stage Moon by Dick Hetchell Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, December 1954 Narrated by Tom Trussell What colours the sky? Still black as the place the devils throw their old razor blades. We'll hear it when we hit air. Pretty soon now. A few minutes yet. Man, my foot's working off at the knee. John awake. Hey, John, you awake? How could I sleep through this? What do you want? Nothing. What she look like? Earth? Of course. A blue beach ball with a white halo around it. What's below us? Part of Asia, I think. Lots of clouds. I see India. Man, it's hot in here. Hell, wait until we hit air. We all awake? Anyone asleep? Say aye. Aye. No one's asleep. I heard four voices. If anyone can sleep through this, they've got my blessings. Woof! My neck! You think you've got it bad. They've got me squeezed in with the camera equipment. I'm bent at the knees and again at the waist. Ah, but after we land. Ah, after we land. And if we land, of course. If we land? Hell, listen to him. He's still got doubts. Unchain that libido, son. We're men of the world now. Of two worlds. And speaking of worlds, we'll rule the world, gentlemen, for a day, maybe a week. Three rousing huzzas for us. Oops, stand back there, son. These gentlemen just got back from the moon. The first men on the moon. The discoverers of a new world. Hell, Pop, I knew it was there all the time. We'll be famous. Our names will be on cereal boxes. The hell with it, I'm tired. Wish I could see out. What's it like? Same as before. I can see someone's leg and the back of someone's head. Damn this lousy intercom. I can't even recognise voices. What's it matter who we are? We're just a lousy pack of sardines till we hit Earth. Good old Earth. Hell with it. Gentlemen, I would make a speech. Also, the hell with you. I'm going to drown if I keep sweating like this. Shut up. I've got something more important to say than your groaning. If we must. The next speaker will be the Honourable... Who the hell are you anyway, bub? We have just visited the moon. Here. There's one more important thing we have to do before we land. You mean slow down? One thing to talk over. Look, Williams, I have a strong suspicion you signed on this trip for some reason beside glory, right? Because Earth was getting too crowded for me. How about you, Wong? Needed a change too, I guess. Been breathing fresh air and seeing people too long. Got sick of it. And John? Well, I suppose I know what you're heading at. This isn't exactly a Jules Verne-type trip to the moon, for the glory and advancement of science. At least it isn't to me. I got sick of science when I was studying for my masters, sick of seeing what people were doing with it. I thought a few new worlds might ease the tension back on Earth, before everything gets blown to pieces. That's what I mean. A few new worlds to explore might slow lousy man in his wild race to the backside of heaven. New frontiers, new excitements. 
It's bound to tie people closer together in spite of their prejudices. But the glory, don't forget the glory, the patriotic zeal. Yeah, the patriotic zeal. I feel the same way you do. Here we're trying to bring the world closer together, and we have to do it in the name of the arms effort of a single nation. War Rocket Experiment 282Z Well, at least we'll be able to say what we think, and we'll be important enough for a while so that people will listen to us. Yeah, when we get down, they're going to say, Speech! They are that. And we are going to speak. Heroes for a day. Maybe two days. And people will listen to us. Not just America. The whole damn world. Show people a larger goal. One big enough for the planet. And all the little power goals will fall away fast. If we can say the right things, they'll have to listen to us. The US, Russia, all the little countries. Here she comes. I hear something. Atmosphere! We're back home. Crisis number six. We can't fail now. Before it's too loud to talk, listen to me. When we land, don't say anything. We'll all get a good sleep and a bath before we say a word. Right? Right. Just give them the pictures and samples and demand a nap. Everybody ready for the final blasting? Here's where I lose another two gallons of blood. I hope we fall in a lake. I'm thirsty as a horse. Man, it's hot. A hundred twenty seconds. I'm not at all sure I can last this. That's straight stuff. Be ready to take over mine too, Wong, just in case. Hell, you'd better last. Sixty seconds. Testing light signals. Are they on? OK here. Yeah. Thirty seconds. Got your lights, Mike? Yeah. Mine too. This is going to be awful. Ten seconds. Five. Four, three, two. OK, here she comes. Well, man, 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 are we down? We sure hit something. We made it. Oh, God, we made it. We're back. Did we get back? Where did we land? Ocean, Atlantic. Well, break the hull. It's awful in here. Hang on, you may get a ducking. Air, real air. Whoosh! Don't let anyone go and poison this air with cobalt bombs. Everyone here, help Joe up there. That a boy. How's it go? Man, we're really here. Where's the reception committee? They were watching us with telescopes, remember? They were going to clear all ships and planes out of the area we were heading for. Remember, no speeches till we get a rest. Yeah, and then I know what I'm going to say. We can't do much, but we sure can do something. Stage one, moon. Stage two, earth. Here they come, planes. Look dignified. Man, look at that rocket out there. It's passing all the rest, coming down from above them. Looks practically wingless. It's going to beat the rest by a decade. Hey, it's black. Is it ever fast? What country is it? I can't see an identification. Say it's going to pass us right by. Look out, it's diving. What's it dropping? Look out! Bomb, 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 duck! The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Science fiction and fantasy and horror, oh my!